Thank you, Sai. We're just going to get ourselves ready up here, just for two seconds. There we go. Welcome to everybody that's uh, with us for the first time this morning and everybody that's joining us online. If we've never met, my name's Vaughan, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here at City, and this is beautiful Lorelei, and she is my wife, which is amazing. Uh, God is uh, faithful, and He is good. And um, yeah, she leads City Woman here uh, at City Hope Church. And uh, we're, we're in a series, as Simon said, and we're in week three of that series. And it's a series called Look at God. And really what it is, it's directly connected to what we felt as elders. God is wanting to grow us in as a church this year. And that is to tell the world about Jesus. The last two weeks have been incredible as Inga and Greg and uh, Kyle and Bailey shared. You don't want to miss out on those. Get onto YouTube, catch up. Great stories. We are all so different and God uses us so differently in the way that we tell people about Jesus, in the spaces that we do. But um, it was so encouraging to hear their stories. What I've realized is sometimes we're just really nervous to step out there. But God still uses us, right? How incredible. Is that and so I'm going to be sharing today under three points look at God, my life for His glory, and then I'm going to be sharing some stories. I'll, I'll finish and then Lorelei will carry on. And really, the verses that we're going to be looking at today are passages of scripture that have been meaningful to us meaningful to us in the sense that they have helped us to see um, who Jesus is and how much He loves us, but they've challenged us and spurred us on to actually step out and tell people about Jesus. So Laura is going to pray for us, and then I'll kick us off, and she'll just sit nice and, nice and relaxed on the chair there <laughs> while I'll sweat it out, and then it'll be my turn later. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that we can gather in your name like this, and we know that when we gather in your name, you are here with us. You are present with us. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that week after week, you speak to us through your word. We hear your voice, and I pray that today would not just be us hearing your voice one more time, but Lord, we would not just be hearers of your word, but we would, we would be doers of your word, that we would listen to what you're saying, and then we would put into practice that which you're teaching us, that we would live in obedience to your word. And so we pray that by the power of your spirit, you would help us to do that, that we would hear, and then we would do, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'm going to get right into it. Uh, point number one, look at God. And uh, this uh, is the first verse, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and 36. Jesus went through all the nations of all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When I look at these verses, I see that Jesus has compassion for people. In fact, he sees the helpless and he sees the harassed. And like a shepherd responds with his sheep, he moves towards the harassed and helpless to rescue them. You know what I'm struck by? Is sometimes the people that look like they are the strongest on the outside, on the inside, are feeling really harassed and helpless. I'll never forget being at an airport one day when uh, there was a bodyguard. He was one of obviously uh, many bodyguards standing there waiting for whoever it was to come through the doors. And I walked up to him and I said, um, you're looking after somebody's life. And he was like a little bit like thinking I'm going to take him out or something. Because I look really scary, obviously. <laughs> no, I just thought I was distracting him. But anyway, I said to him, but is there somebody looking after your life? See, as we began to speak, and it was a very short conversation. This guy had all he needed to look after somebody else's life. But who was looking after his life? There's only one person that can really hold our life in their hands. We're just people at the end of the day. It's God himself. It's Jesus, the one who has compassion on us. I'm so glad that Jesus moved towards me to rescue me, didn't push me aside, 
Don't turn his back on me, but move towards me. That's verse 1. Romans 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I mean, what an amazing truth about Jesus, that he saves. But he doesn't just save, he richly blesses all who call on him. Doesn't favor one person over another. He doesn't favor the one who seems to have it all together over the addict. Doesn't favor the rich over the poor, male over female, Jew over Gentile. He blesses all who call on him. And scripture tells us in this passage what that blessing is. It's not cars. It's not houses. It's not airplanes and fame. The Bible's clear in terms of what it is. The Bible says, He richly blesses everyone who calls on Him, for everyone who calls on His name will be saved. Being saved is the blessing. Some of us sitting in this room have got it wrong. We think when we come to God, we get blessed with stuff. No, we get blessed with salvation. That is the greatest blessing. Are you feeling down and feeling like uh, God has, has uh, not cared for you today? Maybe it's because you're not looking anymore at the blessing of salvation. You're looking at, I don't have stuff. I thought God was supposed to give me that. I'm asking you this morning to line yourself up with true blessing. It's not to say that God can't provide some of those other things, but you want to line yourself up and your heart up with true blessing. The fact that God has saved us. Here's a question for us. When last did you define blessing as salvation? See, Jesus had compassion on me when I deserved death. He saved me when I deserved to be condemned. Many of us in this room can say exactly the same thing. Psalm 103 is so true. It says, He does not treat us as our sin deserves. And so because he hasn't treated us as our sin deserves, my prayer for myself and for us today is, may this cause our hearts to be moved to worship him. Not just in song, but with our lives. We're not wanting to be a Sunday Christian. We're wanting to be an everyday Christian. We don't want to sing songs on a Sunday and our lives say one thing about Jesus and Monday... Where's Jesus? Nowhere. No, we want to be an everyday Christian, living and worshiping Him. And that brings me to my second point, my life for His glory. God wants our lives to be lived for His glory. It took me quite a while to realize that, or it felt like a while at, those stage, at that stage. Um, I'd been following Jesus for three years. I was about 20 years old. And although I knew that God so loved the world... My relationship with God was actually all me focused. My prayers were predominantly, God, give me a girlfriend. You can see I was around 20, right? <laughs> God, help me with my exam. When I started working, God, give me a promotion. God, make me successful. Then a young lady came to church. She came to come and share a little bit of her story. Not a pastor, not a missionary. Just somebody who followed Jesus. And she said, shared some stories about what Jesus was doing on the streets of Johannesburg and in the nightclubs and how God was using her and others to see people's lives saved and changed. At the end of her testimony, she invited some of us to be a part of that. What do you think my response was? No, it wasn't yes. It was not yes. No points for you. I had every excuse under the sun why I couldn't go. I was not good with people. I was shy and introvert. You might look at me today and think, I really am actually still quite shy and introvert, but in those days, it was unbelievable. 
The only thing that has made me step out there is that people need to know Jesus. Who am I to hold back? I can't use an excuse of I'm an introvert or I'm extrovert and not tell people about Jesus. I don't know enough about the Bible. God would never use me. So I didn't sign up that day, but God planted a seed in my heart, a seed where for the first time I would probably say I wondered whether and even ask God whether he might want to use my life for his glory. I had no thinking in my mind then that I would be a pastor one day. I just wanted to be a follower of Jesus in the workplace and wherever I found myself on the bus that could be used for Jesus' glory. See, people had overlooked me. They had excluded me. And so I, when, when I thought about Jesus including me on his team to tell others about him, I thought he wouldn't want me on his team. A few weeks later, a couple of weeks later, actually, I went up to the front of church for prayer. An older guy came up uh, to speak to me. His name was Bernard Davies. He had actually given me a, a, a passage of scripture soon after I got saved. And he walked up to the front uh, now on that night and he prayed, wanted to pray for me. And he said, Vaughan, I gave you a scripture soon after you got saved. Go consider and reflect on it more. And then he prayed for me and he reminded me what the verse was. Now I thought to me, this, this older guy's got one verse in his arsenal. What's up with this dude? Can't he just learn a couple of more, more verses? Every time he meets with somebody, it's the same verse. But he has this thing, and I'm going to read it. Sometimes we want voices from heaven or words of prophecy when what we really need is to sit and allow more scripture, even familiar and known scripture, to really settle in our hearts. And that's what happened and here's a passage of scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this, this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. First time he gave me this passage of scripture, all I saw as I read it is that now that I'm in Christ, I'm a new creation, I'm reconciled to God, my sin no longer counts against me. On the second occasion, as I reflected and pondered on it more, I saw the word we. That meant Vaughan wasn't excluded. That means None of us in this room, if you're a follower of Jesus, is excluded. I saw that we have been given a ministry by Jesus. Not maybe being given a ministry. We have been given a ministry by Jesus. <clears throat> Sometimes we so much want to find out what our ministry is, and there's place for that, but there's some ministries that are already given us. And we need to just embrace them and begin to be used in them. What is a ministry? It's a duty or service that Jesus has given us. And that duty is to share the message of reconciliation. The fact that Jesus saves and forgives those who believe in him and reconciles us to the Father. I saw from this passage of scripture that we are Christ's ambassadors, ones who allow God to make his appeal through us. See, God was using this passage to move my thinking and my heart from a place of God for my story, God make me famous, God serve my agenda, to a place of my life for his agenda. And actually in the same passage of scripture, verse 15, it's spelled out for us what God expects of us when we put our faith in him. This is what it says in verse 15, and he, meaning Jesus, died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again in its entirety, including telling others about Jesus. Thank you, Lorelei. Doing a fantastic job there. I'm glad you're not relaxing too much. <laughs> My summary, really, after reading uh, that passage uh, was simply this, because I loved you, Vaughan, I sent people to you to make myself known. 
because I love people, Vaughan, I want to do the same for them. I want to send you to them to make myself known. Don't live your, your life yourself, Vaughan. Live it for me. And as I looked at this passage of Scripture, I saw many other passages of Scripture, ones that we kind of just stand in awe of Jesus' love for us, that help us to see that on the one hand, and it's so good that we do because it starts with us, but then immediately move into this fact that God loves other people too. And he wants to use us to tell them about him. Romans 10, I read a little bit earlier and I finished with this verse. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The very next words are, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. People have opportunity to say yes to Jesus, call on his name, because other people who know him go and tell them. Matthew 9, I finish with this verse, verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, which is immediately followed by, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. See, God's heart is for us to know him. God's heart is for others to know him. God wants us to tell others about Jesus. We saw last week as uh, Inga and Greg shared, we're commissioned to go, we're commanded to go to the nations. We won't all go to the nations. Sometimes the people that we're going to go to is our next door neighbor, our colleague at work, our, our friends at school and university. But I want to ask you this as a question. When last did you pray a prayer concerning his mission? When last did you pray? Maybe you've prayed that prayer concerning his mission. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But when last did you pray, Lord, make yourself known as I speak to my colleague, to my friend, to my cousin about you later. Lord, save them. I'm going to tell you some stories. Um, stories of simply what God does when we say yes to him. I've just seen it over the years. Stories about how great he is to uh, move in people's lives. I want to preface these stories by saying I've not arrived when it comes to telling people about Jesus. So you can breathe a deep sigh of relief. I don't think there's any of us in this room that have arrived. I'm still prone to make excuses. I'm still prone to prioritize self over God. I need boldness and confidence to tell people about Jesus like any of us in this room. Standing here today, I feel like I have not shared or told enough people about Jesus. I don't feel like I've done well in this over the years, considering how long I've known Jesus. Stories I'm going to tell you today are stories predominantly where people, as we shared the gospel, got saved, but that's not always the case. We're not called to see uh, just people saved in that moment. Wonderfully, Jesus does save people. We're called to share the good news. He'll do the saving. And so, yeah, some stories. Year after that girl came to come and speak uh, to us at church, I joined that team to the nightclubs. I was a complete newbie. I was as scared as anything. I thought I was going to get killed inside there. But Jesus saved people. Bouncers were saved. One of them a few weeks before he was shot and killed. The owner of one of those clubs was saved. His office in that club became a place where we could disciple him and others in that club on a Saturday evening. Five days of my week weren't spent doing the outreaches in the clubs. They were spent in the workplace amongst bankers. I started to tell them about Jesus, prayed for them, listened to their stories, counseled them over coffee breaks and lunch times. We started a Bible study so that uh, people could be discipled in their faith. Lorelei and I have been part of many short-term mission trips um, one of them, or uh, the, the main one that uh, we were on, was joining an organization that were reaching out to North African Muslim people. 
we merely gave them a package. In that package was a Jesus video in Arabic and some other literature. We didn't pray any salvation prayer with them, but in that package was all they needed to know how they could be saved. And as they got saved, they wrote away in tens of thousands to different locations around the world for material to be discipled in who Jesus is. Some of those people even came to South Africa, began to train, uh, get training in God's Word so that they could go back to the underground church and pastor and disciple people. There's no part of our life that God can't use in some way. Saw that on our recent trip to, Les, uh, to Lesotho. One boy with a tennis racket amongst a whole lot of soccer players, netball players, boxers. A sport I play, tennis. We begin to hit to each other. That forms a connection, then a conversation. And then one of the other guys on the team preaches about God as a father. Calls for a response at the end. And this young man comes down to the front to ask for prayer. It's not Vaughan's great. It's Jesus is great. There's no season of our life that God can't use us in either. As I said, I used to work in the banking space. And uh, there was a lady that had just joined the team. She'd been looking for work for months. She was so excited to have a job. Probably a month into her having a job, maybe a little bit longer. We were all called in as a staff to be told that uh, this particular foreign bank was going to be pulling out of the country. We were all going to lose our jobs. I walked in on the Monday and I do something, was doing something that I often do. I'm not often found humming a worship song. She said, how could you be happy at a time like this? I said to her, and I explained the gospel to her, how I could be a whatever Hindu lady. She didn't respond to Jesus that day. But I know that God sowed a seed there that day, and he'll watch over the seed and he'll do what it, with it what he wants to. And so, yes, uh, really my challenge to us who know Jesus today, many of us have said yes to Jesus for salvation. Others in our world need that salvation. Just remember what a big thing it was that Jesus saved you, what that actually means. Other people need that salvation. Today, Jesus is wanting you to say yes to him again, but this time it is yes to go tell others about Jesus. Lord, send me. Use my simple words or complex words, if you're able to do that, to see others come to know Jesus. Lorelei. I'd like to share a bit of my journey, but I want to say hello to my friend Tondo, who's watching online. And um, so I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And um, my, my parents used to take us to a church to go to Sunday school and then to Guild or like youth on a Friday afternoon. And as much as I loved being with my friends and loved singing the songs and hearing the stories, it wasn't a gospel preaching church. And so I'd never heard the gospel. So my first encounter with the gospel was from my little nine-year-old friend at school. And she sat on the step and told me about Jesus. She told me that Jesus had died on the cross for me to take away my sin and that I could be reconciled to the Father. I don't think she used the word reconciled, but <laughs> she told me that I could be friends with Jesus. And so I said to her, so what must I do? And she said, go home and get on your knees and ask Jesus to come into your heart. So I did that in the bathroom next to our wash basket and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And although I didn't understand how to live out my faith and what exactly what this meant, um, because I wasn't going to a church regularly to be taught or to be discipled, um, and this is why I'm actually so passionate about discipleship and about the Great Commission, is that we need to, yes, see people saved, but they also need to understand how to live out their faith. And Inga and Greg spoke about the Great Commission, about going into all the world and preaching the gospel, baptizing people, and teaching them to obey everything that God had taught. And so I tried, in my limited understanding, to live out my faith and to, to be a Christ follower and to change my ways and, uh, but I kept failing, and I kept sinning, I kept making mistakes. But how would I have known how to live for Jesus? I'd never read the Bible, I didn't own a Bible, 
And it was only when I was baptized at 20 that I first picked up a Bible and I had one. And so I was never taught about the essence of the gospel, this great exchange that we experience when we come to Christ, that we give him our sin and he gives us his righteousness, that salvation is by faith and not by works, that it is a free gift from God, and that we receive the power of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit lives inside of us to overcome the sin that we struggle with that I was chosen by God, and through faith in Him, I now became a child of God, and that His love for me was unconditional. So even though I didn't understand all of these things, I'd given my life to Christ, and it felt like His hand was upon my life. But every friend that I ever had from that time, close friends around me at school, in high school, and I'm still friends with one now, Michelle, she's been an incredible influence in my life, And um, even at college, I had several friends that were devoted followers of Jesus that kept pointing me to him, kept encouraging me to give my life to him. And so in my final year of college, I studied art in Pretoria. And my friend Kirsten said to me, have you ever been baptized? And I hadn't. Uh, Something I had considered in high school, but I was very shy And um, I saw when you were baptized, you had to give your testimony in front of everybody, and there was no ways I was going to do that. So I put off being baptized, but that day I just knew I had to go. So we drove to Hatfield Baptist and asked the lady at the office if one of the pastors would baptize me. And she said, come back on Sunday and we'll baptize you. So I went back on Sunday, and it was then when I declared Jesus publicly, when I confessed him before my friends and my family, that my life changed radically, and there was no going back. And so when I read this passage later on in my life, I realized this was my testimony. And I want to read from 1 Peter 2, verses 9 to 12. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Some translations say marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. This was my testimony. This is what God did for me. And I wanted everybody to know that. And so I wasn't shy about sharing my faith. I wanted people to know this Jesus, that it lifted this heavy burden of sin from my life, that it had removed the shame and the guilt that I experienced, that they too could come into the light and experience Christ the way I had, that they would move from darkness into light. They would move out of a place of maybe being isolated or feeling a sense of being orphaned and come into the family of God. And that was a huge thing for me. Being in the family of God was the most wonderful thing for me. And so I began to to witness to my family, sometimes in very awkward and unconventional ways, but um, I told them about Jesus and what he had done in my life, and I think they could see the change in me, the radical change, and that was a testimony to the saving power of God. My mom had come back to the Lord um, just a couple of years before when she had been praying and obviously been praying for me and praying for our family. And so I joined her in praying for the rest of the family to come to salvation. And my dad was the first one to come to salvation after I had had the thought that this man is unsavable because he was so hard-hearted, but he was also unchurched. He knew nothing of the Bible and nothing of the gospel. And so we used to have very in-depth conversations, and they used to get very heated. Um, But we used to talk about God, and one day he said to me, Lorelei, when I retire, I'm going to that church of yours. And uh, so he did. And uh, he came to salvation, and God did what seemed impossible. And I'm sure there are people in your life, you think to yourself, they are so far from God, they're so hard, and every time you try to talk to them, they push you away. But just know that God is in the saving business. And so my, God, my dad started going to church regularly, and he started reading the Bible, you know, from cover to cover. He did that a couple of times. And then my mom and I, and I'm sure my dad as well, used to started praying for my oldest brother, Gordon. 
And we prayed for him for 10 years. And I remember a time that I was praying very specifically for him. I had a burden. I don't know if you sometimes just get this deep concern for somebody in your life. Um, you, you feel concerned about their lives and how they're living their lives. And I was working in Joburg, and I had to go and do some work in Pretoria. And on the way back, I had this heavy burden on my heart to pray for him. And I was praying and crying out to God for his soul, from the depths of my soul, that God would save his soul. And I began to cry uncontrollably, so much so that I had to pull the car over and just sat there praying. And it was just this moment that I had with God, and I, I knew in an instant that somehow something had shifted in the heavens and that God had heard my cries, that he was going to do something for my brother. And I read Psalm 18 verse 6 the other day and I thought this describes it so well. It says, in my distress I called to the Lord, I cried to, the, to my God for help. From his temple he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. I want to say to you today, God hears your cries for those that you love, those that you are feeling concerned about. He hears those cries. Never stop praying. We prayed for 10 years. And it wasn't a week or two later, my brother had been attending an Alpha course at the church that we were at, that he gave his life to Christ. He came to salvation, and my friend drove up the road to, to tell me this good news, that my brother had come to salvation. So I didn't have the privilege of leading him to the Lord and praying the sinner's prayer with him, but I was able to play a part, as did my mom. My mom and I used to give him verses when he was going through a difficult time at work and try to point him to Jesus in that way and pray with him sometimes about those situations. My dad would invite him to church. As my dad was unchurched, he didn't understand how to explain the gospel. But when him and my brother used to cycle in the morning, he used to say, Gordon, you need to go to church, and you need to take your family to church. And eventually Gordon did it. He heard the gospel through the Alpha course where it was explained beautifully, and he gave his life to Christ. That must be almost 20 years ago now. And I still get tears in my eyes, Gordon, and I often look at each other when he prays at a family gathering. We were not praying people. We were not godly Christian people. We didn't grow up that way. So how amazing to see this saving power of Jesus in my family and in, you know, in their lives. And so the reality is that his eyes were blinded to the gospel. And we read about that in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 7. It says this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who, know, sorry, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not of ourselves. So we see in this passage that the gospel is often veiled. So Satan, who is the God of this age, he blinds the hearts and minds of people so that they cannot perceive they cannot understand, and they cannot receive the gospel. But then we also need to understand that the gospel is not understood with our natural minds. It is through the scriptures, and as the Holy Spirit enlightens and shines light on those scriptures, that we begin to understand. It says in that verse, For God made his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. And if you're a Christ follower here, that is what God has done. He has revealed by the Spirit Christ to you. And those are two words in the New Testament, reveal and revelation. It means to uncover or to unveil. The drawing back by Christ of the veil of darkness covering the unbeliever. That's the work that God does when we proclaim the gospel. 
And so for us to see that unveiling and happening, to, happening in people around us, there are things, things that we have to do. The first thing is we need to pray for those whose minds are blinded and cannot understand. They wouldn't even know how to pray. And so God is calling us to pray that he will push back that curtain and that they would understand. And then we need to proclaim the gospel. Vaughan referred to Romans 10. And even in the most simplest ways we can, like my little friend Benita explained the gospel to me, we can share the gospel with those around us. Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is the power of God to bring salvation to everyone who believes. So we need to take time to proclaim the gospel, not just saying to our friends, I go to church or use God's name in some of our conversation. We actually need to explain the gospel, even if it's in a simple way. We need to explain the gospel message because it's as we do that that people begin to get an understanding. It's in that gospel message, and as the Holy Spirit shines light on their heart, it's like a switch that is flipped in their hearts. Then we need to live as light bearers. In Ephesians 5 verse 8 it says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. Our lifestyles need to reflect Christ. Because as we live out our faith amongst unbelievers, it gives our message a sense of weight and validity. And then the fourth thing I just want to mention is that we need to be aware, as it says in verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 7 of that chapter, it says, the treasure of Christ and his saving power is held in these jars of clay. God's not expecting us to be perfect or to ex proclaim his message in a perfect way. We do the best we can with the knowledge that he's given us, and he, choose, he does the saving. He chooses weak vessels like us. And so I studied at Africa School of Missions for three years, and then I did an honors at BTC, which is the Baptist College. And many of you know I've just finished the master's in missional leadership, and I did that because I felt God was calling me to do those studies. But over the time that I was studying the last few years, or the many years that I've studied, it almost felt like it had become, um, it had inhibited me in some ways. It had taken away that spontaneity and that passion that I had when I first got saved to preach the gospel. And so I've really had to try to get back to that place because God would lead me to speak to somebody, maybe someone in a shopping center. And then in my mind, I would be doing backflips thinking, okay, how do I explain this properly and perfectly and think about all the, the gospel language of justification and sanctification and condemnation and think I must be able to explain it succinctly and perfectly. And then sometimes I would think, I, I can't do this and I would shrink back. And so I want to say to you today, our knowledge or our lack of knowledge must never be a stumbling block to us to preach the gospel. I will encourage you 100% to do that institute course. Gain the knowledge and the experience or the, the understanding of how to share the gospel. My studies have helped me tremendously in ministry. But don't ever let it be a hindrance to you. Share the gospel in a simple way. Share your gospel story like Stephanie did and live your life before people. You will be a light to them and God will use your life. And so I found the time in Lesotho and even at Street Store the last couple of weeks was really helpful to me in that because we had to, because of the language barrier, I had to keep it really simple. And so I felt some of that spontaneity just coming back to me and just having these heart moments with people and just being able to be natural and be myself and not overthink things. And I can't remember where I was now. Where am I? <laughs> oh yes, then I wanted to tell you about this. So when I'd finished studying, I started working, and in my first year of studies, I felt God calling me to ministry. So I was at a church, and I was being discipled, being taught how to live out my faith, which is an amazing time. But it was in that time that God began to show me that I'm called to ministry, and he used Acts 22, you know, Paul's Damascus Road experience. And he gave me, out of that passage, this verse that says, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. 
And so I thought God was calling me to full-time mission work, and so I went to study at Africa School of Missions. And uh, as I was there, I realized I'm not really wired for this. I don't like roughing it too much. So, um, so I was like, I love the gospel. I love people. I love to minister. But this is a bit asking a bit too much. But it wasn't about that so much, but that God was calling me to pastoral ministry. He spoke to me so clearly about that. But it was through ASM, through the church that I was at that was very mission orientated, and my conversion that I developed a heart for the gospel and for missions. And so I've been on several outreaches, weekly ministry into communities, going door to door to homeless shelters. I've been on short-term mission trips, as Vaughan said, to Morocco, to Spain, to Lesotho twice. I've shared the gospel in many counseling situations. It gives you an amazing opportunity to share the gospel. And I've even shared the gospel from the pulpit when I get an opportunity to do that with friends at work. But honestly... I've been so deeply challenged just recently that I feel like I've only begun to scratch the surface. And I know that this season of my life has to be characterized by preaching the gospel and making disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. And my prayer is, Lord, help me. Help me to be obedient. Help me to be bold. Help me to, as I prayed in the beginning, not only to be a hearer of your word, but to be a doer and to be a light bearer in this dark world. So while I was at ASM, God gave me a verse, actually a chapter, it's Isaiah 49. And this, I'm just going to read you a couple of lines. It says, it's too small a thing for you to be a servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light to the Gentiles that my salvation might reach to the ends of the earth. And amazingly enough, before we were married, God had given Vaughan the same chapter of Scripture. And so when we came together, we realized that God was calling us to ministry. He was calling us to the house of Jacob, which is the people of, of God, to do pastoral ministry, to care for the people of God. But that wasn't all he was calling us to. He was calling us to be a light to the Gentiles. And so we know that the light of God Need, or people that need to be saved, unbelievers need the light of God to be saved. There needs to be this unveiling in their hearts as God shines his light on their hearts. But we as believers still need the light of God as we are working out our salvation. And so Ephesians 1 verse 17, Paul prays this for the church at Ephesus. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. There is great power within us. And so I ask you today, do you want to know him better? Do you know the hope to which he has called you? Are you aware of the glorious inheritance you have as a child of God? And have you understood the incomparably great power that resides in you? If you're not sure of that, then you need to pray that same prayer. Lord, shine your light upon my heart. Enlighten my heart so that I can have a deeper opportunity. We have led many people, even in church life, to Jesus. And don't assume that every, everybody sitting next to you is a Christ follower. There's opportunity for us to preach the gospel in this place. There's opportunity for us to preach the gospel in our workplaces, in our schools, in our universities, wherever we find ourselves, with our families. And there is opportunity for us to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so God has put his light in our heart, and we are light bearers. And he wants us to shine his light into dark places.